Welcome to Digital Ship webinar. Today's topic is more effective planning of seafarer workload to avoid overwork and fatigue. We'll shortly discuss this with our two guest speakers, Anissa Rizvanoli, who is the team leader at the Fraunhofer Center for Maritime Logistics and Services in Hamburg, and Charles Watkins, founder and managing director of uh, Mental Health Support Solutions, also based in Hamburg. This is the first webinar from the series on making crew planning easier, sponsored by Fraunhofer, that we'll be exploring on the two following Tuesdays in May. Now we are jumping straight to the problem of CIFR workload with Carl Jeffrey, founding editor of Digital Ship. Let's go, Carl. Okay, so you, you know what CIFR fatigue is. Um, what we thought when we were sort of planning this is maybe seafarer fatigue is actually a problem of bad software and the way to fix it is good software so explain that so the bad way of planning seafarer time with software so say you're just treating somebody's time like a box in a spreadsheet you're allocating the boxes to the tasks and then when the task takes longer than you thought it would as tasks often do we just ask people to report how long they plan to take doing the work not how long it actually took so we comply with the rest hours and everybody gets exhausted and the situation never improves but there's good ways we can use software so in a good way of using software we make realistic estimations of how long tasks would actually take and we get accurate reports back and we'd be continually learning so we make better and better estimates we've got software that can plan all the things that are dependent on other things so we've got a schedule that actually works and we can also make sure that we're giving people the proper amount of sleep they need and not just the number of hours of sleep they need because six hours of rest from work is not going to give us six hours of sleep. So while it's sort of obvious seafarer fatigue is bad, I thought we could put more depth on the subject. We've invited perhaps a world expert on seafarer mental health, Charles Watkins, who's the managing director of mental health support solutions in Hamburg, to share his perspective. They're a company that provides mental health support services to seafarers and shipping companies. So he's going to explain some of, the, some of the impacts of fatigue we might not think about so much, like how it makes it much harder for us to maintain good relationships on board, how we lose concentration when we're tired, which may have safety impl implications, and also how it messes up our digestion so it can drive us to caffeine or high glucose food, and that also makes our health go backwards. And he's also going to share some thoughts on why the industry perhaps doesn't give fatigue as much consideration as it should do, considering how dependent we are on healthy people with high levels of concentration and good working relationships. So secondly, we're going to hear from Anissa Rizvanoli, who leads the team Maritime Scientific Computing and Optimization at Fraunhofer Center for Maritime Logistics and Services in Hamburg. So she's going to give us what should be a good way to use software. So it's much more richer, much more sophisticated than just putting people's hours into boxes, but uh, we come up with something that's um, good for both the individual and for the company. A uh, special field of interest is developing mathematical models and methods for solving challenging real world problems from the maritime domain as a uh, crew scheduling, I think, is one of those. So we're going to start with um, Charles, who's not going to give any slides, but just give his thoughts. So I'd like to invite Charles to speak. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me uh, and greetings, everyone. Yeah, my name is Charles Watkins. I'm a, a clinical psychologist and a psychotherapist and a managing director at uh, MHSS. Uh, so what we do is we do the 24 seven support for seafarers. We talk to a lot of seafarers on a daily basis. We do trainings for seafarers as well, which is very important and not just getting to know them and their challenges, but also giving them some tools that helps them when they're doing their daily activities to maintain their positive mental health. And we do uh, groundwork, uh, which is we visit vessels when, when, when bad things happen and we stabilize that vessel. We offer psychological first aid and then we talk to many seafarers and we often have that topic come up a lot, fatigue and not enough rest and um, accidents that happen due to, due to fatigue. So let's, um, let's just start by understanding what, what fatigue really is. Uh, I think it's good to define it so everyone knows where we're coming from. It's, fatigue is kind of a persistent feeling of being mentally and physically exhausted, right? So it may feel like a lack of energy, you might, you might have a lack of motivation, lack of strength, uh, lack of focus, okay? And fatigue is a tricky one, right? Because it's very difficult sometimes to get that type of good rest, especially 
due to weather conditions or shift work, it's really challenging for seafarers, right? So fatigue is also associated with a fair number of, of other psychological conditions, right? Uh, like, like grief and stress, which is work-related or can be family or financially related, right? Or depression or the course of anxiety can also have a, an effect on fatigue, okay? I think it's important to note, and I want you to take this with you today, is that insufficient rest and insufficient sleep on a ship has, is very dangerous for the safety of, of the vessel, all right, for the work performance and for occupational safety and health. Uh, and I would like to explain to you why this is. And I'm sure some things you probably haven't heard of yet. So let's first look at sleep loss and, and fatigue and your body. So what happens, okay? Let's look at the cardiovascular system. Is there a relationship? What's going on there? Can we kind of look at fatigue and our cardiovascular system and see what happens? Uh, there's actually a huge experiment done every year. Uh, it's actually called daylight savings time. And the interesting thing to note is that when this changes, we see uh, about in spring, we see a 24% increase in heart attacks the following day, okay? And then changing back that time, so when we add an hour, we get more rest, more sleep, we see a 21% reduction in heart attacks. So it has a real effect on our body, an immediate response, so to speak. And I think you'd be surprised on the amount, um, the effect, the gravitas it has on our system as a whole. So road traffic accidents, they, they go up when, 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 we, when we lose an hour and suicide rates go up um, and, our, and our immune system even responds to it. So let's take a quick look at our immune system. Uh, they did a, a big experiment and um, they just deprived people of four hours of sleep. So they had four hours in sleep total, okay? Instead of eight, they had four hours. And I was expecting to see, you know, uh, in terms of when we talk about immune system, we talk about natural killer cell activity that's able to battle, you know, any type of, of, of problems in the body like viruses or any type of cancerous things or, or infection. Now, after just one night of four hours of sleep, we, we saw a, uh, we saw a 70% drop in natural killer cell activity, okay? And this is very concerning when it comes to immune deficiency, especially in times of COVID. So uh, what I want you to remember is that sleep is kind of the pillar, uh, is the foundation, pillar and foundation uh, of, of everything else that, go, that goes on uh, on a daily basis, okay? And we're going to get to the mind in a second. So this is a concerning stage of immune deficiency okay, in COVID times, which we need to understand, we need to address, and we need to, we need to understand it so we, can, so we can educate and we can protect uh, future uh, seafarers from this real threat and this real danger. Mm. So let's look at sleep and the mind. Mm. What happens is just by losing four hours of sleep or an entire night deprivation as well, processing information correctly goes down. So the way we process information, how we correctly are able to use that information to, to make decisions goes down. Uh, we make decisions based on our level of fitness. And, 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 if, and if we don't have enough rest, that decision is clearly not what it's supposed to be when we have enough rest. Um, so my, some of you might, might know that the need for sleep is also important in learning activities. Right, mm. so rest and sleep is important, not just for learning things, so for processing it afterwards, but before we learn things. So getting good sleep, getting, not being fatigued when we're learning things, okay? And not just after uh, learning things is important because the brain is able to process these things in a better way. So if you're educating people on board, if people are learning on the job, if they're young cadets, or if you uh, are trying to find solution to a problem and you're continuing it the next day, uh, no matter where it is, if it's deck or the engine room, it's detrimental um, for your ability to remember what you've, what you've learned the next day uh, to get 
a, a regular uh, uh, rest and, and sleep hours in, okay? Mm. There was a study done, I think this is quite astounding. There was a study done with a sleep deprived group compared to a group, a regular group, which got about eight hours of sleep. And they put them in an MRI and they looked at the brain and, and, they, and they learned new tasks um, while in the machine. And they found out that the uh, sleep deprived group had a 40% deficiency uh, uh, in, in learning new tasks. And that's major, uh, especially when your decisions um, are extremely important and have to do with safety on a vessel, okay? So when we don't get enough sleep, it also have to, has to do with our deep sleep brain waves, all right? Um, when we're in deep sleep, um, maybe you've seen like um, sleep waves, maybe you haven't, but you know, they often analyze this in, 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 in a laboratory setting. Uh, what you do have are, are something called sleep spindles and, and they're kind of, a, a lot, there's a lot of electricity going on there, but they're actually helping shifting your, your memories, uh, your short-term memory into your long-term memory. So they're actually helping you integrate what you've learned and making them become permanent so you can use them the next day, okay? And remember, when we're fatigued, when we don't have enough rest, when we're sleep deprived, we tend to try to help ourselves with maybe unhealthy coping strategies like too much caffeine consumption, which can make matters worse, especially when, when people have anxiety, right? It raises your anxiety level. We tend to eat more sugary and fatty foods, okay? We don't seem to make healthy food choices that often. Our motivation to work out, to, to do physical activity goes down. And we can have relationship problems, not just with our family and friends at home, but also on board because our ability to balance out emotions, our ability to read the situation correctly decreases a lot. So we take things personally, we are more irritable. Uh, we're unable to kind of understand um, the big picture because we are, we are, we are fatigued. We're sleep deprived. We, we don't have that luxury anymore to use that, that part of our brain that helps us do planning. Uh, yeah. And visiting a lot of vessels in the past and talking to seafarers after accidents and mistakes have happened, it's interesting because they often say they don't know how they were thinking or they don't know why they acted this way. So as you can see, they understand the mistake, but they can't recall why they made that decision. And that is because, first of all, your, your ability to recall um, isn't really working properly and you're not in a good state to make the best decisions when you're extremely sleep deprived um, and when you're fatigued and when you don't have enough rest. So remember, uh, a lot of the, the things that we've experienced while going to vessels and visiting them and understanding what happened had to do with just not getting enough rest, not being able to get enough rest, okay? It has major implications when it comes to safety and, and, and work accidents. So let's look at some things we can do to counter this fatigue and tiredness, okay? Mm. Avoid sleeping during the day. Obviously, when you're on shift work, that's different, but avoid sleeping during then. If you do take naps, try to keep them under 20 minutes. That seems to help a lot. Mm. Try to go to bed and wake up at the uh, exact same time if possible. Um, this helps you have a certain type of routine and try to cut caffeine uh, for a week and test the difference. I know this sounds a bit difficult to do, mm, especially you'll feel tired in the morning, but caffeine may actually worsen your anxiety and can even disrupt sleep. So it's an idea. And one easy thing to do is drink enough water, like try drink about two liters of water a day to avoid fatigue and, and, and help you uh, stay hydrated, all right? Because um, fatigue due to hydration is also something that's very prevalent because people just forget to take enough fluids. And that's something you can do that's quite easy to remember. Mm. Avoid heavy foods at night, all right? Try to eat a balanced diet, try to eat a healthy diet and power down your screens at least an hour before you go to bed because, or, or get a blue, blue light filter app or something like that. It, it helps you power down. There are natural 
processes in your body that have to do with, with, with receiving light that will help you produce sleep hormone, which will make it easier for you to go to bed. Mm, if you can get exposure to sunlight, um, go up and try to get some sunlight if it's possible and exercise at least every few days. This really helps your body regulate certain, certain things and, and, and downregulate stress so you can have a better night's sleep. Okay. And try relaxation techniques if you haven't already, like breathing techniques, meditation, progressive muscle relaxation. There's a lot of free stuff out there on YouTube you can try. Mm. And one last important thing, if you can't fall asleep and if you're tossing and turning, get out of bed and do something else so your brain can associate your bed with just sleeping. Because we tend to use our bed for surfing, watching videos, doing all types of stuff. So what you want to do is you want to make sure your body and your and your and your and your mind associates bed with just sleeping. Um, that's one of the best things you can do, and then it's easier to fall asleep. And you train your brain to see your bed as this is the place I only sleep. I don't do anything else, and it'll make it easier for you to fall asleep. Um, so yeah, remember it's it's your life support system sleep. Everything kind of sits on, on your sleep and, and, and uh, it's important to know this. And I think it's one of the greatest uh, maritime health hazards if it's not addressed properly. So thank you so much for uh, listening to me today on this very important topic. And I will give um, yeah my word uh, back. And so thanks so much. <laughs> oh, that's great, Charles. Well, that's fantastic. I, I think this is the first time we tried to combine um, mental health with a uh software ever before but I, I think it came across in many ways how these two subjects are very linked i mean the, the one thing about preventing fatigue you didn't mention is the uh, the schedule of work people have to do but that's also outside people's control which is a uh, yes. what we're going to get on to now so i'd like to invite anisa to talk about how we can make a schedule for crew where they can uh, get their work done in a much more comfortable way yeah thank you carl thank you charles for the very very interesting um, presentation and talk basically um I'm, I have some, I brought some slides with me. I will share them. So. I think. Yep, that's fine. You can see my slides. Well, well um, yeah, it's um, also, yeah, welcome to the webinar from my side. Thank you for joining us. Um, um, we are talking about crew and human resources, you see it's my first point here. Um, uh, I'm going, today I'm going to give an, uh, some, some insights into methods and approaches that we have followed and, and implemented at Fraunhofer a Center for Maritime Logistics during the, se uh, the last seven years, also in common work with uh, different shipping companies, quite large shipping companies, to tackle the problem of crew scheduling by taking very strongly into account this work and rest hour regulations, which you see there are be uh, beside the voyage. So our main aim is to find out uh, how many people do I really need for, um, for a given ship and a given voyage in order to run the ship in a safe way, to operate the ship in a safe way. And to safety, it doesn't only belong doing accomplishing the tasks that are needed and the maintenance work, but also to assign them timely in such a way that they fit to the voyage and uh, that the persons who, who is assigned to that task also have enough rest. And maybe just for more, yeah, um, to, to take, um, to have a, an idea of what we aim to is such a detailed work schedule. So we want to be able to calculate a work schedule based on the voyage, assign the task to the right persons on the right time. For example, if, you, if your berthing is between 10 and, and 11, then everyone should be mooring between 10 and 11. But um, reassign the rest of the tasks, which maybe are more flexible in such a way that there are enough rest periods, basically the legal one and maybe a kind of buffer for in order to prevent fatigue. Um, we have, we want to include various tasks, you maybe see here the maintenance ones, and uh, some of you maybe are familiar with plant maintenance systems and know that the tasks there are, dis um, are defined in a very detailed way. And maybe some of you also know well that the rest of the processes on board does not have such a, such a database. 
So uh, they are in the mind of the persons. Everyone knows, well, I have to go for watch and okay, mooring is mooring and the admin uh, administration, it's also to get done, but you don't really have them on a, on a, on a digital way well-defined as, for example, in the case of, of plant maintenance job, as, as is the case for the plant maintenance job, so that you can schedule that this way. So basically to, to enable the schedule, to enable the handling of this problem, of the tackling of this problem, you need um, um, a basis, a digital basis uh, for your data. And that's where we have worked on in the last year. So I will talk today about this first part how to, how to um, define in a, in a good way, how to create a very good databases for further on working with algorithms and scheduling and doing the schedule in the right way. We have um, initial situation was that there is a lack of qualitative data that represent processes on board. It's more or less um, in, in the jobs description, which are not very uniquely and well defined, uh, and in the experience of, of the persons on board. And there is also a, kind of a lack of methods that we stated to gather the data in an easy and not very invasive way. So we don't really want um, seafarers to additionally write down what they have done the whole day in two hour workshops or to discuss about their work. We wanted to, to, to create a, a, a program or a, a method that enables them to very fast and easy document their work, uh, work hours or give feedback on their work and on the um, tasks that they think are mandatory for a safe ship voyage. Well, the scope is, um, as I mentioned previously, to have this task defined in such a way that we can at the end, calculate schedule, discuss on the schedules, run different scenarios, and be able to see what, what happens. So what are the main factors that really, um, in a quantified way, impacts my crew size, my fatigue problems, my work and rest hours, and what can I do differently? What are the strategies to run to change the way of working in order that we can avoid this kind of problems, maybe send more people on board or um, reorganize their qualifications. Well, um, scope is quite clear. If you have the data, at the, if, you, if you are able to gather data at this level, at this task level, of course, you can run a lot of analysis, whatever you want in the fleet-wide data. For example, you can investigate the ratio between plant and unplanned maintenance. You can correlate it with the age of your ship. Um, you, there is a high potential of database methods to analyze and understand uh, the actual situation. And that's what we have done in the last three years. We have developed a small tool, which is more or less, I, I, I label it or I call it as the um, digital timesheet. You know, most of you who are familiar in the shipping industry, there is an MLC timesheet to, yeah, to be written down from the seafarers and um, to document the work periods. And we have moved it into the digital part. We don't take care at this moment about um, compliance with work and rest. We just want uh, to, to give the seafarers a tool to easily um, document their work day. So they can just choose from a predefined list of tasks or defined tasks by themselves if they don't find the ones um, that they are working on and put it into the time span and say, okay, I have been on the mooring station from 10 to 11. And after that, I moved to the bankering station and stayed there like six or seven hours and uh, maybe the next day again on watch. And this is um, this um, approach. We have tested it with some cruise ships. Went very good. So it was easy to use from the seafarers. They were within minutes done because the tasks they are. Um, we we're not aiming to define everything that happens on the whole day, but basically try to document the most relevant task for a safe ship voyage. As I said, like bunkering, mooring, the pilot takeover. And it was quite easy, so we got some data. And um, we have um, the, the main aim of uh, combining the data, the main aim was to combine the data with the position. So to find out a little bit more uh, which positions are really doing the tasks um, in, in everyday life. So there is one theoretical part, which is the qualification, if you are qualified for the task, and then you, as you would like to see, yeah, the persons who are qualified for the task do also the task. And there is the other way, which is the reality, and you see how do they handle it on board. 
for. So which are the persons involved um, in the same task, which are the positions, not really persons, so we are interested in the positions um, involved in the task and how long um, do they spend, uh, how long do this task last, um, have, which is their duration. Um, one can run a lot of analysis to find the current situation or to, to validate it. You can see why is the crew schedule different when uh, the ships are of the same type, maybe, and they are running on the same voyage. You can also go into discussion on a database way with your crew, because there is also what we have seen at Shipping Commons is always a discussion. Well, um, to, to, to different fronts, to different parts, the, the onboard uh, guys and the office guys, and they are always saying, well, um, we have not enough people, send us more people, and the office guys say, well, we don't know why we need uh, so uh, many people more. And this is a way to talk on a data-based way. So you talk on the data that has been gathered, and you can come up with a good solution for both parts. Um, of course, it's interesting for us for the further calculations to find out the correlation between tasks and voyage phases. So which, um, at which phase uh, must the task get done? Uh, is there a correlation at all between them? Is, some, is, is a task a daily job? So it doesn't matter if, if you are in port or if you are in, in, um, in transit or if you are taking the pilot, or is the task really binded to that special, um, special part like in anchorage or during birthing? And this is what you can find out by, by analyzing and, and taking a look at the data that has been defined on board and used. Further on, of course, you can run a lot of analysis like, as I previously mentioned, basically the, the ratio between a planned maintenance and unplanned maintenance. And you can also make a correlation between the age of the ship and this ratio, I suppose that unplanned maintenance would take longer in an older ship than in a, in a new building. And maybe for, for cost reasons, um, shipping companies are interested between the, um, the, the distribution of unplanned maintenance who has been uh, worked out by the crew and by, the, by external parties. Um, also here I have brought with me some very, these this are not real, data, real world data, so it's just an example. You see, if you, if you, if you run this um, the software on board and take the data for one year, for example, then you can see how is the distribution between the different categories, which, um, how, which is the percentages of time that my crew spends on watchkeeping, on mooring, on maintenance, and you can also see the, the um, during the time, how, how it increases or decreases the maintenance part, for example, or ISPS related tasks, if some new requirements um, hold on, and maybe for Corona times, <laughs> to, to, to find out how much does it cost the persons on board to do additional tasks in order to, to accomplish all the additional measures that are now um, yeah, required by everyone to, to face the problem. Another um, add-on that we found out was plant maintenance. Um, well, plant maintenance systems, they, um, they have a responsible person. And the, this is the only guy who just checks down, yeah, the job has been, um, was done or not. We are overdue, we are not overdue, but you do. The, to at least the plant maintenance system that I have seen until now, didn't have any additional part to document who really did the job. So mostly it's not like the chief engineer does all the jobs himself. He, he um, delegates the jobs to, to the ratings or to his engineers. And then you can really find out how complex are these jobs. Some of them need like five persons on the same time for two hours. And some others can be done daily on a minute basis. And um, this helps companies or has helped the companies that what we, we, which we have worked with um, to, to quantify their plant maintenance strategy because shipping is a very special case. You do maintenance and, and a safe ship operation is done by the same crew. And if the maintenance department decides to increase the, the frequencies, 
then it means more workload for the group. Um, ba and basically, this is one way to quantify what, uh, how maintenance impacts the, um, the crew workload and how maybe other strategies that are defined from the shipping companies, like, I don't know, maybe security level areas, when you decide to run the ship with many watchkeeping seafarers at the same time, because they are high, uh, highly risk, high risk piracy uh, areas. And then you can also see what does it impact for the for the workload. How, how can I get out of uh, out of that? And well, this is a very generic slide. Um, what I want to say with with that is that you, if you able to, if you are able to to document the data and to get the, to gather the data at this very detailed level, then you are able to run whatever analysis you want to do. Maybe on a ship specific way, on a fleet wide way, or maybe you would like to group your ships into. Okay, um, I cannot compare really a very old ship with a new building, so I will create sub fleets and do some comparison between uh, ships and see how can I steer with another crew uh, consistency for older ships maybe who needs more maintenance and um, define uh, or go another way of um, well qualification of seafarers and um, additional additional qualification could also help to to make the crew schedules better and to enable more seafarers to take over jobs so that the one guy who is really full of jobs the the chief officer is not um, always running into, into incompliances of course into fatigue issues and this is the first part so we're I hopefully we are going to meet next week when I'm going to talk about all the scheduling so how do we get this data and schedule them in an automatic way by taking into account all work and rest hours so basically today I have a little bit of talked or, or focused my my talk into the transparency through data driven basis for discussions so we create the data, you can discuss on that, you can define it with your crew together. This is a col collaborative process. That's, that's the thing that I found very good at the end of our projects, that the crew was not like said to, you have to use that, but please give us feedback on, on your own work. And um, by doing the analysis, you can let them also look into, into the, the data and see what can be done the other way around. And, the next, um, the next weeks we are going to talk about how algorithms can also help to increase the decision support uh, yeah, in, in, in this quite uh, challenging problem. So thank you. I am now very happy to, to discuss a lot with um, all the people that, are, that has jo have joined us. Oh, that's great. Well, I'd like to invite everybody to put questions in the Q&A box. You see Nigel Cleave has already asked a question. I'd just like to bring um, Ch Charles back in, um, first of all, in terms of when you visited ships and you talk to people who say they're tired, do you get any impressions about the scheduling systems you've seen and, and how well they work? I mean, I guess that the basic method is that there's too much people are asked to do and there is, when I mean, I'm just asking you to present the other side when the scheduling is very bad, is that the... Uh, so yes, there are, let's, let's put it this way. Mm, there are challenges when it comes to scheduling because they just don't have enough people on board. All right, that's the bottom line. And, um, and of course, you know, the, the system isn't really conducive to showing exactly what they've actually worked and how they've worked. There, there's the ability to work way too much without it being properly registered as, as a problem. So I think both sides uh, when it comes to the system itself, it's it can be optimized. And when it comes to just simply having not enough men, not enough seafarers, um, men and women, not enough seafarers on board to to deal with with the workload. Okay, so so maybe for Anissa, I mean, if if the discussion is, I guess this group of people think we need more people, and this group of people are paying the bills, and we're in a competitive market situation. But that's not very helpful when we get this silly argument. But what you've presented here is ways you can make this conversation a lot better, isn't it? So, and actually yes. perhaps reduce costs by planning better rather than just saying we need more people. Is that a... Yeah, that's the that's the truth. So I'm going to talk a little bit more deeper on, on this issue next week. Uh, so basically the next step would be to calculate 
how many people do you really need theoretically and face and uh, put it against your safe manning. So because um, safe manning is done for in general, but for specific for, for specific voyages, the, let us take the Northern Europe, you are within three days and, and four ports. The workload is huge in a very short time. So of course you want to really calculate how many people do you need additional, which are the positions that are affected most that you need additionally for this short, um, for this quite high workload within a very short time. Oh, okay, so there's a question from Nigel Cleave. I remember he used to be managing director of a very large ship management company, but I'm not sure which one, but he's asking about how, how the ship shore communication works. Um, do you mm -hmm. want to talk about that? Is it yes, emails uh, we, or? Yeah, not really. So for some for some small shipping companies, we have done that by emails and, and exchanging um, yeah, text files because it, they didn't have the, the infrastructure. But, uh, for the ones who have the infrastructure, we do just a database uh, update. It's done automatically at the um, so at the, in the background once a week or every day. You get the data. You, the, the office has the same database based on the data from the ships. Oh, okay. So there's a question for Charles from uh, Jean Christophe, who is in Paris, uh, Director Division Neonatology chez NatTech on his LinkedIn page. He's asking about reducing tricks for the third night of uh, sleep. The third night seems to be worse in terms of fatigue. I've heard people say the same thing about jet lag. Is that, I know you're not really a sleep expert, you're a mental health expert, but I don't know if <laughs> you'd like to have a go at this one. Or maybe you are a sleep expert as well. You're on mm. mute. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. So first of all, before I answer this question, let me let me make this perfectly clear. This is not healthy. Um, so this shouldn't happen, and and this is very dangerous. And and if 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 I if I'm hearing things like falling asleep standing up, that's an alarming that's an alarming message that shouldn't happen. That especially when you're on a vessel, especially when safety and the work environment is very dangerous, this shouldn't happen. Now, that being said, I will give you some tips that may boost it, um, but it's not something I would promote, but I'll give you the tips anyway. Now, the, I, I think I'll give you three things that are the best things you can do. First of all, um, drink enough water, like I said. The more you're hydrated, the better your body will be able to deal with this type of fatigue, okay? Um, number two is, yeah, number two is eat more often, but eat small meals. So if you are able to eat small meals uh, more frequently, your blood sugar levels will be more steady and you'll be able to battle that fatigue a little bit better. Um, and studies show that, that omega-3 seems to be um, a player when it comes to staying more awake when you're fatigued. So eat fish. Or, 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 or some types of nuts that have omega-3 in it. Those two things will help you boost it. It will make you feel better. But again, it's not, you know, it's, it's <laughs> you should try not to do it at all. But if you have to try those things, they might help. <laughs> Thank you. And, uh, and Easter, I guess this isn't something your, your models do the third night being worse for shift work, I suppose, but it could do. I suppose you could model anything as long as the that's what the yeah. clients want, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can model, of course, the dependencies between the tasks, and you can also model your work and rest hour, so to, to be specific for the person. So to say is the one guy who is always added to the night shift, maybe have or maybe should have a larger rest block. And also what you can model by this, if you have the data, and if we go to that, that scheduling um, stuff, you can... Um, calculate how do different uh, work and rest hours uh, definitions impact the crew schedule. What happens if maybe, maybe, um, um, IMO says, well, six hours, uh, that's too, too short. We do eight hours out, out of it. And uh, we say that the large rest block from the two blocks in the 24 hours, we do um, eight hours. And then you can calculate the impact that it has for your crew sizes. And maybe that's interesting for flex states in this case. I know that shipping companies would never say it now. It's now like, uh, well, I need more crew then. But um, if all actors would work together on that issue, then maybe we could have little less problems with all fatigue, which on the other way, it's quite expensive for everyone. 
for the persons on board for for not being compliant. So you you take your your de detention rates and um, you have accidents, which are in the at the end of the day also quite expensive. Okay, so Tomasz Cizielski, I think he's the manager riding team at Carnival Maritime in Hamburg. He's asking about integrating the software with other systems like plan maintenance systems. Is that something you do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we, we're able to. Uh, right now, we have faced only very closed pl planned maintenance systems, so they are, they are not really willing to, <laughs> to share the data, but we, um, the planned maintenance jobs that we integrate there are um, like, it's, it's an interface to existing ones if, if the systems would like to. And we also would be very happy to, to give the feedback back if the job is done on our system to to give some some kind of trigger to the plant maintenance that is done, so no one, uh, so we can um, save this guy who is doing the checks manually uh, from this kind of job. So let the systems do that. If if they if the job is done, then he has only one single point of entry to to mark this. And as I read, he is also asking about voyage planning. Um, yes, voyage planning is also another point where we can uh, write interfaces. Um, at currently, I haven't seen at, at uh, our customers, from our customer size, that they have a voyage plan in this detailed way. So basically, when berthing and like pilot is remarked or additional to the work packages, yeah. And that's uh, that's why we haven't written an interface. But we, if we can get some of this information from somewhere else, we are happy to write the interfaces, fetch the information. We don't have to be a closed system. It's not. It's we we don't want to be the next closed system in the shipping industry. Oh, that's great. So we've got a bit of a Polish theme here. Darius Szefianak is a crewing manager with SMT Shipping in Poland. He's like to pick up Charles on your. Uh, why can't you nap shorter than 20 minutes? <laughs> Something you'd like to answer? Uh, yes. Uh, so let's see. There, uh, yes. Uh, all right. So uh, there are uh, there are systems in place uh, in, in our brain that, that have to do with certain periods of sleep um, and activation of certain types of brain waves that help you get a better rest when it's actually short. It doesn't... It sounds counterintuitive, but it actually makes a lot of sense if you if you kind of know a little bit of the neurology behind it. So shorter, up to 20 minutes will help you boost energy, will help you stay alert. Um, but going above that, an hour, for example, you're getting into like a sleep. So as you know, there are sleep cycles, usually from stages, sorry, stages from one to four or one to five, depending on the country you're in. But they have to do with your activity during that sleep. There's REM sleep, then there's one, two, three, four. And the, the later ones are deep sleep. And the more you get into that sleep cycle, the, the, the trouble is that you're not as focused. You feel like, uh, like you're more exhausted because you'd like to sleep more. The, the body was getting ready to sleep more. So to make it uh, just in simple terms, shorter is better because it boosts activity and wakefulness and focus. The longer it is, the more it goes into a cycle, a stage of sleep. And that's when you when you get up feeling exhausted. Thank you. Okay. So, so Nisa, I'd like to ask, you mentioned a big client before we started. Are you, are you able to mention any client names or any specific projects just so we know this isn't like an academic research project? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. we have begun all this journey together with Bernard Schulte Ship Management and uh, like seven years ago, AI Shippard in, here in Hamburg and moved on to Klaus-Peter Offen, um, which is also a container shipping company. Um, right now, uh, we also have done some plant maintenance for specific, specifically for plant maintenance. We have worked with Columbia Ship Management, and uh, right now we are working with Carnival Maritime, uh, the, the shipping manager for Aida and Costa. Wow, that's a, that's a tremendous list of clients, and it's a very, very competitive market they work in. It's not like you're just working for very rich family-owned companies here. You're, uh, but I don't know. Without pushing you too much, I mean, are you able to say what benefits? they specifically got from well from this um, specifically from this data data sharing and data definition is really this transparency that they were able to talk uh, about their processes on a very uh, task based way that was the main the main advantage that i have seen of course the data is defined per company and then we leave them alone to find to to to, to do whatever they want with their own data so it's at the, as the, the moment where we get to step out 
and maybe we come in into a later uh, point in time and help them with the data analysis. But this transparency and uh, data creating the database is um, is quite the it's the most uh, biggest advantage that I have seen, uh, independent of what kind of, of shipping they are, uh, ships they are running. Well, she's supporting a better business conversation. That's fascinating, yes, isn't it? Yes, a process change, so a, a paradigm change of talking on uh, talking about data, not like uh, I I think that in my opinion. So move opinion to to data. Oh yeah, that's amazing. I mean, just in a business context, when I mean, you you must be saving companies money, you know, otherwise they wouldn't be able to do it. I guess it's not just about. I mean, you can save money by planning better, not from cutting crew, isn't it? I suppose. Is it? Yeah, that's that's true. That we uh, we have stated that the, um, the yeah the main advantages are more or less a qualitative ones. So you do better crew planning, everyone is happy, and you have a safer voyage. That's the main idea. So you um, you don't have so many problems with the work and rest hours. Um, you avoid being detained by port states control, and which is a little two twice twofold better one from the economical part and from the reputation part, because at the end, shipping is still small, even if it is worldwide. So if you have like uh, four times a detention, then everyone knows that. And your charter parties will, will also know that. So you are quite uh, in between the, the chairs. Yeah, no, that's fascinating. I mean, often something we find about the shipping industry, we go back decades, is people don't like spending money on software. And and it's, it's maybe more 20 years ago than now. Hopefully it's changing slowly now. But, you know, when people just bought software when they were forced to and, uh, you know, making the point that software can really help things run better is yeah. still quite a cultural change for, for shipping, I think, isn't it? And uh, yeah. it's great to see this, this happening, isn't it? I think, uh, yeah. Oh, that sounds great. Yeah. Well, there's, there's, no, there's no more questions. I don't know, Charles, if you've got any 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 final words you'd, you'd like to do about... um. I mean, I mean, the whole commercial issue, I think, is very interesting because it's just means something we can maybe move something more with rather than just saying this versus that, I suppose, isn't it? But uh, there's definitely big commercial issues here as well as personal interest issues, aren't there? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's it's very important to note that people are looking into this because it's it's just um, it's a huge risk to safety. And, and the problem and insure, insuring insurance companies are interested in this because this is something that can be prevented if we properly address it. And the first step is what we're doing right now is bringing awareness to it and, and, and showing the link between between safety, accidents and fatigue. And I think this will, you know, um, lead to more discussions and eventually proper solutions to this. Um, but I think this is the best first step we can take. So thanks for having me. I feel honored. Yeah, oh, it's great. I haven't seen insurers get involved. I listened to lots of talks from insurance about where they see the biggest risks. They always talk about COVID and cybersecurity and finance. They never talk about, I guess, this is something that ought to be on the radar a lot more than it is. I don't know. Yes, yeah, so it's lovely. Yeah. Don't you have some cl closing words, Anissa? Do you think? Yeah, I also want to, to thank you for, for the webinar. And um, I would really like to join what uh, Charles said. So raising uh, raising the awareness uh, to that um, special issue and um, yeah, and uh, a, a bit a holistic view of it. It's the, the thing that makes a change. So if you just uh, take only the view of I saved money, that won't really bring uh, more safety. So if we only if we take it holistically as it is in reality, then we can really change things. Oh, that's great. So um, if, if everybody uh, find this interesting, hopefully we'll see you again next Tuesday. We're going to get more into depth into how to bring this into maintenance. And I'll pass back to Vida for the closing words. Cheers. Yeah. Thank you for staying with us this last hour. It was the first part of more effective planning of crew workflow, workload to develop deeper understanding on more effective CFR planning with digital tools. Join us and Denisa on Tuesdays, May 11th and 18th. We'll dig into compliance with rest hours and later crew deployments on the vessels. We'll see you next Tuesday. Goodbye. Bye -bye. Goodbye. Thank you. Thanks. Goodbye. Thank you.